Welcome to Inside Israel, everyone. I'm Joel Chasnoff. It is July 7th, 2024, and coming to you tonight from Ra'anana, Israel, right outside Tel Aviv. Tonight's episode is a special one. We have a guest joining us later on. My longtime friend, Brian Jaffe, will be here to talk about a very unsettling incident in Ohio when Jewish gravestones were destroyed, and he's going to tell us how the Cincinnati Jewish community reacted. Tonight's episode is called Jew Squared, as in Jew with a little two next to it, Jew Squared, or Jew times Jew. And the focus of tonight's broadcast is going to be on violence from one Jew toward another. I've talked about this several times on Inside Israel, that I think this is the greatest threat to Israel right now, more than Iran, more than Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, is the internal strife we're having in Israel right now. And this actually isn't, it's not an original idea. It's an idea that I've gotten from a few experts, but one person in particularly. If you've read my latest book, Israel 201, in the final chapter, I interview a futurist. His name is David Pasig. He is one of the most renowned professors here in Israel. And like I said, he's a futurist. He studies the future the way others study the past. He looks at current social trends and economic conditions and um, just socioeconomic movements to predict what's going to happen down the road. Pasig was able to predict the destruction of the Twin Towers in 2001 in the late 90s. He said that within the next decade, there will be a major attack on a Western monument that represents capitalism. And lo and behold, the Twin Towers were attacked in 2001. He predicted the uh, the coming about of smart refrigerators and tools and appliances that we interact with. This was in the late 80s that he was talking about this way before anyone else could really foresee these kind of inventions coming. And so I interviewed Pasig in the last chapter of my book, Israel 201, to talk about Israel's future. And he was adamant that of all the threats to Israel, the greatest one of all is the threat we have inside the country, Jew against fellow Jew. And the reason, he said, is that when it comes to our external enemies, whether it's Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, or even a nuclear Iran, we can put together a plan for how to handle it, for how to either strike back or strike first, as the case may be. But when it comes to the internal strife in Israel, it's a lot more complicated and it takes a lot more courage to act early because it will certainly upset the social balance that we have. And that's an uh, idea I want to explore today is Jew on Jew violence, which is why the episode is called Jew Squared. Now, when I say Jew on Jew violence, you can probably think of a few examples yourself. These are the obvious examples. I'm going to share three. I have a feeling that one of them will be obvious to you, but that two of them might not be so obvious. And those are the ones I really want to expose you to tonight, just so you realize the full scale of what's happening here in Israel right now when it comes to this topic. So let's start with the most obvious one. This is maybe a story you've read about wherever you are in the world or heard about. It's the idea of settlers in the West Bank literally attacking IDF soldiers and policemen. And I don't just mean with shouts. I mean with rocks, with bottles, uh, violently attacking IDF soldiers and policemen. This has happened several times over the past couple of weeks. When the IDF and Israeli police have been sent in to illegal outposts in the West Bank, as you may know, there are, it's called the Hilltop Youth, but in addition to that, it's their families. These are settlers who literally go to a hilltop and set up an illegal settlement uh, on this hilltop or on this piece of land. Typically, it's land that has already been designated to Palestinians, what you would call area A of the areas A, B, and C in the West Bank. And they claim it as their own, and they set up a little village. And by village, it could be just a few tents, not even a trailer. And the army then goes in to clear out these illegal outposts. And this happened a few times over the past few weeks, that when the army and police went in 
Hilltop youth and the West Bank Jewish settlers attacked them with stones, bottles. It was violent. Uh, there were injuries. There was certainly damage to uh, IDF property. And the to give you a little context, it reminds me a little bit of the Branch Davidian FBI massacre in February of 1993, when you have citizens of the country attacking the authorities of the law enforcement body of that country. And what they have in common is the, the cult element. And that is one takeaway that I really want you to understand, is that these extremists in the West Bank, you should not think of them merely as Jews who are more religious than the rest of us, or who are religious in slightly a different way or more extremely religious. They're a cult and they behave like a cult and their ideology is cult-like. Same with the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. And this fits in the category as well, my first example of Jew on Jew violence. As you know, I've pointed out so many times that one of the biggest issues here in Israel right now is the drafting of the ultra-Orthodox so that they can bear the burden of serving in the IDF as well. Uh, just this week, the Knesset is voting to officially extend the service of 18-year-old Israelis, males and combat units from two years, eight months to a full three years, increasing by four months the amount of time they're required to serve in the army. They've already voted to increase the age of reserve duty here in Israel, adding an extra year to reserve duty so that those who are already serving are now going to be serving more. At the same time, the Knesset is refusing to pass legislation that would officially draft the ultra-Orthodox Haredim into the army. Last year alone, if you've listened to this broadcast, you know the stat, because I point it out every chance I can. In 2023, 66,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews, men of military age, were given exemptions from serving in the IDF. This at the same time that everyone else's service is being extended. And again, you can hear arguments that the reason they don't want to serve is because they're worried about the laws of kashrut being upheld, or they're worried about mixing with women in non-humility, um, humble situations, what's called sniut in Hebrew, or that they're simply afraid they wouldn't be able to observe Shabbat the way they need to if they serve in the army. This is hogwash. They are a cult. The Haredim, like the extremists in the West Bank, are a cult and they behave like a cult and they listen to their leaders in cult-like ways. And this is what Israel has on its hands. One of you wrote in tonight with a question, what's going to happen when the ultra-Orthodox refuse to serve in the army? Well, we're already seeing the answers. They are becoming violent too. Several times they have blocked major highways here in Israel, often at Coca-Cola Junction. If you drive on Highway 4 from the airport when you land in Israel, if you're going toward Tel Aviv, there's a good chance you will past the Coca-Cola factory on your left. Uh, this is Coca-Cola Junction. This is B'nai Brak, where many of the ultra-Orthodox Haredim live. And they've been violent as well. Uh, they haven't been throwing rocks and bottles yet, like those in the West Bank. But I assure you, we are not far from that. Even though they are religious Jews, it's not like they are adhering to the principle of treat your fellow man like you would yourself, be kind to others. That is all out the window. They are willing to be violent. They will be violent. And they have. They've been rough with police officers who've been trying to clear them from the highways. The slogans they chant um, in, you know, to soldiers die in Gaza and uh, et cetera, really violent rhetoric that they're using toward the army and the police that are protecting them. It's, it's really disgusting. And those of us who aren't part of those communities here in Israel, which is the vast majority, are really fed up with it. So that is my first example of Jew on Jew violence, is the extremists in the West Bank and the ultra-Orthodox Haredim literally attacking Jewish policemen and the IDF in violent ways.
So that was the more obvious one that you've probably heard about and certainly that I have uh, talked about before on this podcast. The second aspect of Jew on Jew violence that I want to bring up is the opposite direction, which is the institutions attacking Jewish civilians. And we're seeing this at the demonstrations that are happening around the country against the government, most often in Tel Aviv. There's actually a big demonstration happening right now in Tel Aviv as we speak. This is known as one of the days of rage here in Israel, uh, protesting the government and calling for an immediate hostage deal, which does seem to be on the table right now, something viable that Israel could accept. Every Saturday night, there are these big marches around the country as well, most notably in Tel Aviv. And to help clear these marchers, to help clear those who block the highways, the police have been getting extremely violent lately, using water cannons on Israeli civilians, including on doctors who are volunteers simply to treat those who are injured. There are doctors who wear an orange vest, and this orange vest signifies that they are not protesting, they're not a marcher, they're just there in case anyone does get hurt to take care of them. And a number of these doctors have been injured by the police spraying water cannons at them. One very well-known case was a, a woman doctor who might be blind for life in one of her eyes. You can go online and see the picture of her because she was sprayed directly in the eye with a water cannon. Uh, at a recent march, one of the police began beating a demonstrator and started screaming, I'll rape your mother in Hebrew. This is the kind of rhetoric we're seeing from the police towards civilians at these marchers. And it's not out of nowhere. The minister of the police force, Itamar Ben Gvir, has given instructions to the police to be violent against civilians. And I brought up that name, Itamar Ben Gvir. Here's another takeaway you, you should come away with from tonight's broadcast. Right now, Itamar Ben Gvir is the most powerful Jew in the world. I'll say it again. Ben Gvir is the most powerful Jew on earth right now. And the reason is he is the one keeping the coalition together. Netanyahu's government crumbles if Ben Gvir and Smotrich decide to leave the coalition. And over and over, Ben Gvir has been threatening to leave the coalition. He said that if Israel signs a hostage deal with Hamas, he will leave the coalition and topple the government. And he's been saying this any number of times along the way. And Netanyahu always listens to him and does whatever Ben Gvir wants, because he knows that Ben Gvir is the one who, if he bolts, would bring the government down. So more powerful than Bibi Netanyahu, more powerful than the chief of the uh, chief of staff of the IDF, it's Itamar Ben Gvir. And he's been very outspoken that the police should be as aggressive as possible against the demonstrators, who he sees as traitors, not just against the government, but more importantly, against him personally. He's very childlike and he takes things very, very personally and doesn't belong in government at all. And, uh, Israel, you know, most Israelis would prefer that he not be in government. But the way the coalition is sent together right now and set up, he has a lot of power. So that's the second example of Jew on Jew violence that I really want to make you aware of. And that's the institutions literally being physically violent with civilian Jews who are typically protesting peacefully. So the third example of Jew on Jew violence is it's a little more subtle and probably less known. But I wanted to include it in the narrative because I still think it belongs in this overarching category. This kind of Jew on Jew violence isn't necessarily physically violent, but it's more about abandonment and neglect. And I'll share what I mean through the story. Uh, as you know, my wife Dorit has been very involved with trying to raise money for various people and organizations who need help here in Israel. 
but specifically she's been working with soldiers. And at the beginning, it was very much focused on soldiers who are about to go into Gaza, helping them get the equipment they need, sending food down as treats, as a way to give them a warm meal, a nice send off before they go into Gaza, buying them mattresses, new boots, uh, other supplies that because of numerical logistical reasons and also economic reasons, the army simply wasn't able to supply. Right now, she's turning her focus more towards soldiers who are coming out of Gaza. Uh, she's doing a lot of work with one organization that's supporting soldiers with PTSD. And she also gets requests here and there from the individual soldier who just heard th <laughs> through the grapevine that this woman, Dorit, is helping people. And one request she got this week came from the friend of a soldier who's been serving in Gaza for eight months. He's a combat soldier. In his real life, he's actually a physical trainer. He does one-on-one -on -one coaching to help people get in shape. So he's a physical trainer, not a very high salaried job in Israel, but he was making enough to make a living. Then he went to Gaza and he was there, like I said, for pretty much eight months straight and just got out. And what he's finding in the few weeks that he's since he's gotten out is that all of his clients who were going to him before for coaching and physical training have moved on and have found someone else. And they are now sticking with these new coaches that they have and not with him. He doesn't have really any clients right now. So his business is completely it collapsed. He's getting a little bit of money from the government, but not nearly enough to make up for the lack of clients that he now has. And so um, he's actually getting married next week. And uh, he's 27. He's been with his girlfriend, fiance for 11 years since they were 16. And Dorit has been raising money for him so, to, so he can have some of the basic things at a wedding that most grooms would take for granted. She was able to raise 650 shekels, which is about, what, $200, a little less, so he could get a suit to wear at his wedding. And um, she's raising money for other small things like a cake and balloons, et cetera. But the point of the story is that here is someone who really gave his due to the country, who went me'al u me'ever, above and beyond giving to Israel. And now when he's getting out, a lot of Israelis are not doing the right thing. The right thing would be to hire him back or to help him find work with someone else. Um, and they're not doing that. They've simply moved on with their lives. We have another example, our gardener. We have a nice porch. You probably can't see it behind me, but if you see that, see that black window, that's a porch behind me. It's about 100 square meters. This porch wraps around our entire apartment. And Dorit built a little garden out there. And our gardener, Amit, about 10 months ago, literally, uh, it was a month, probably about a month before the war began. He set up some sort of uh, irrigation system connecting our hose to the plants so that we didn't have to water them every day. Instead, there's like drip irrigation uh, that waters the plants for us. He came back last week. He too was in Gaza for about eight months. We hadn't seen him for a long time. And he told us that all of his clients have done the same thing. All of his clients have left. Uh, especially with summer when they needed to redo their gardens and get the irrigation systems going, they moved on to other people. And I can't really blame them. They weren't going to wait for Amit to come out of Gaza to, to, uh, to take care of their gardens. But now he's in a position where he doesn't have income as well. And so this is, this is another form of Jew on Jew, I wouldn't say violence, but Jew on Jew neglect and lack of looking out for each other. Uh, you know, this we're now nine months today, nine months out from October 7th. Hard to believe. And we're all thinking about the hostages. We're all thinking about the soldiers. But in our daily lives, I've pointed this out before, we also have move on. And we are continuing to do a lot of the normal things we do in our daily lives, including hiring the people we need to hire at the moment to keep our own lives running. But it's left this vacuum for all of those soldiers who were in Gaza for seven, eight, nine months. And right now, many of them are being neglected. So that's the last example of where we are falling short when it comes to Jew on Jew relationships. 
It reminds me also of the idea that the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, is coming up on, on August 12th. And the whole idea behind the ninth of Av, the Tisha B'Av, is Sinat Chinam, which literally translate to free hatred. But what it really means is hatred for no reason at all. That is the reason that two temples were destroyed and all these other bad episodes happened on the 9th of Av. It's because of Sinat Chinam, not our enemies, but because Jews were not looking out for each other. So this is a big obstacle. And all the experts, myself included, not that I'm an expert like these professors, but I think I know Israel well enough to agree that this is the number one issue we need to solve in order to have a healthy, viable, democratic, equal, equitable, fair Israel moving down the road. Hamas we can handle, we already are handling. Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, we're handling them. Even Iran, we're able to solve if we're clever enough, use our Israeli know-how, if we have the balls to act like we did in the past. The Jew-on-Jew -Jew relationships, those are the obstacles we need to deal with. I said before that I fear there could be an assassination at some point. I still feel that way. I feel when it comes time to actually clear out certain West Bank settlements, or when it comes time to draft the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox for real, that there could be the killing of an official at some level or a soldier, I hope I'm wrong. God forbid that would happen. But the way things are trending, I could see this kind of violence at that extreme happening down the road. Now, you might be wondering, is there any room for optimism? And the answer is yes. This professor, this futurist I mentioned before, David Pasig, he is very optimistic about the future of Israel. He is, as you would say, as a stock trader, he is long on Israel. But in the short term, this is a very volatile period we're going through. We'll look back on this period, and by period, I don't just mean 19, uh, 2023 or 2024, but this entire period, probably from... 1982, Lebanon War, which is the first war we began fighting that wasn't for our existential existence, through probably the next 20 years from now, maybe more. But this period of Israeli history and Jewish history will be seen as one of the, mo one of the most tumultuous ones, but the one that gave birth to the good Israel that's ahead. But we're living through it right now. As David Pasig is fond of saying, Nobody in the Middle Ages knew that they were living in the Middle Ages. No one in the Renaissance knew that they were living through the Renaissance. Only later on do we look back on these seminal periods of time and label them. And I think we're living through one right now. We're going to take a very quick break so I can take a drink of water. I'll be back in about five seconds with some of the news items from this week. And welcome back to Inside Israel. A reminder, in a few minutes, I'll be joined by my friend, Brian Jaffe, who's not just my friend. He's the CEO of the, I believe it's called the Cincinnati Jewish Foundation. He will remind me of his exact title when he's on to talk about the desecration of Jewish gravestones in Ohio over the past week. First, though, let's quickly look at some of the big news items out of Israel right now. Number one, far and away, is it looks like there is a viable deal for the release of hostages on the table. I'm not going to go into the details of this new hostage proposal. Apparently, the big game changer is that Hamas is willing to back away from its demand that Israel agree up front to in a see an eventual end of all war in Gaza. Their demand for a ceasefire in writing, they are willing to back away from that. What they're instead willing to do is to have a negotiating period where 
if all goes well, then Israel would pull out of Gaza and end all uh, end all of its combat operations inside Gaza. The reason Hamas is backing away from this, it's because our military is doing an excellent job in Gaza. I've been saying this all along that you might hear, you know, this and that, that the operations aren't planned well, aren't going well. I am talking to soldiers. I'm hearing from soldiers and friends of soldiers. The soldiers are all saying the same thing, that we are dismantling Hamas and that we need to be patient. It's not going to be immediate but that Hamas is falling apart. Uh, and we're seeing that right now. This is why Hamas is now saying that they're backing away from this big final demand that they had, because th their only chance of survival right now is to get Israel out of Gaza. If we keep fighting, they won't have any chance to survive, which makes you ask, why should we agree to this deal? It's because we can get our hostages out, all of the hostages. This deal would call for the release first of the uh, humanitarian cases, which is the elderly, the sick, women, including women soldiers. And then in the next phase, it would be all the remaining hostages, men, soldiers, male soldiers. And by the way, this includes the soldiers who are no longer with us, who are dead, their bodies, getting them back. That is a priority for Israel as well. Right now, we, have, we believe that they're probably in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 living hostages still in Gaza. To... Most Israelis see this as a no-brainer, and I'm going to get to that in a second in terms of what the actual numbers say. But that is the big story in Israel right now. This is a viable deal that Israel can agree to, that most Israelis want Israel to agree to. Netanyahu has already put out some signs tonight that he's not going to agree to it. He's hinting at that. I'm predicting that if he does not take this hostage deal, hell will break loose here, and that instead of 100,000 people this Saturday night in Tel Aviv, you would see 200,000, maybe half a million all over the country coming out. Uh, I, I know several people who have not protested yet who've said that if this hostage deal is not accepted, they would be out in the streets as well. But that is the number one story by far, is that it looks like we, we have a deal that we could actually agree to on the table. Number two is the war in the north. Uh, for so long, I've been telling you that the war is coming. I still believe it's coming, but I'm going to delay it. I don't think it's going to happen this summer. I'm changing my tune. I actually think it might happen a year from now, six months from now, or even further out. It just seems, here's what I'm reading. It seems that Hezbollah doesn't really want a war. Israel knows that Hezbollah doesn't really want a war, and we are spent. We are spent in terms of weapons. We're running out of the weapons we would need and ammunition to have a full-on war with Iran and the other backers who would join Hezbollah. And also just emotionally and physically, we don't have the manpower to now go into another big war. I do think the war will happen eventually. But in terms of this summer, I actually don't think it's going to happen this summer. That's just what I'm seeing right now. So that's the second big story. Story number three is the polls. And I mentioned before, I'm going to go over the actual numbers related to this hostage deal. So we had some we had some poll numbers come out this week, and I think these are worth paying attention to. Let's talk about the hostage deal. Two thirds of Israelis. I mean, anytime it's over 50%, that's significant. We are now talking over 67%. Two thirds of Israelis want the government to accept this current hostage proposal that is on the table. Even if it means we don't, quote unquote, completely dismantle Hamas, we are at the point where we believe that getting the hostages home, those that are living still home, and even getting the bodies back is our number one priority. We are now nine months into this, the aftermath of October 7th. Two thirds of Israelis want this deal to be taken, to agree to. A few other interesting poll findings. When asked who they prefer as the next prime minister, it's actually someone who is not in the government right now. Naftali Bennett, who was the prime minister at one point for a very short period of time. A lot of people, by the way, are looking back on him nostalgically as an opportunity missed that we didn't do more with him as prime minister. But Naftali Bennett 
right now is the one who win, whether it's polling him against Gans, Benny Gans, or polling him against Netanyahu, time and again, Naftali Bennett is the one who emerges as the number one pick. And what people envision for Naftali Bennett is that he would head a coalition that is center right, which is very interesting that for all the talk of anti-Netanyahu, anti-Likud in Israel right now, Israel, Israelis in general still want a right-wing, slightly right-wing government, just not with Netanyahu leading it. So that's significant. It's also significant for me, by the way, personally, because he lives down the street from me in Ra'anana. And uh, back when he was prime minister, he decided to live at home. He, he has a beautiful home. He was in high tech. He did an exit that made him worth few hundred million dollars, I think. And so he doesn't want to live in the prime minister's residence. He would he stayed in Ranana in his house. And no, you know, there's always when you're the prime minister, people are unhappy with you. And people would protest him on Saturday nights as well. And they would march right past my apartment, banging drums and blowing trumpets and all the other Michigas. So um, you know, I guess I gotta get used to that if he's prime minister again. But he is the number one pick uh if people had their choice for a center right coalition. Another finding is that over 50% of Israelis believe that Netanyahu is running the war out of political reasons, that political reasons are the basis for his choices into how to conduct this war. Also, the vast majority of Israelis, 60%, want elections to be held either now or immediately after the war. So I think that is significant as well, that we are ready for a change in government. We're going to take a quick break. Again, five seconds, and then I'll be back with Brian Jaffe. So Brian, I'll turn on your camera in a sec. Stay tuned, everyone. I'll be back in a few. All right, welcome back to Inside Israel. Brian, how are you, my friend? Hey, Joel, it's great to see you. You need to, oh, one of us needs to unmute. You need to unmute, I think. And can you make sure I'm unmuted too? Hmm. Am I muted? No, still not hearing you. Guys, a little technical difficulty. Give us a couple seconds to figure this out. Hmm. Okay, Brian, are you hearing me? I'm hearing you. Okay, I'm not hearing you for some reason. Oh, the... Eric, some people are telling us that they hear us both. I'm not hearing Brian, though. Uh, let me see if I can change Joel is that any better no Ryan talk to me now how about now is that better mm, no or or now all right let's uh think one more thing we can do here I'm trying one more other thing. Is that any better? I got you now, Brian. Okay, good. Someone give us a thumbs up. You hear us both? Yeah, nice. Okay. So first of all, Brian, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell me your exact title before I get into my first question. Remind me. I'm the CEO of the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati. Great. So I got that right. And what does your, your job generally comprise of? Just to give listeners a little bit of background. We're a private grant-making foundation located in Cincinnati, and our, our mission is to advance and strengthen the Jewish community here. So we invest in Jewish education, Jewish engagement, 
uh, Jewish social services agencies. Um, we're, we're just trying to make the Cincinnati Jewish community the best possible community it can now and, and for generations to come. So what I wanted to ask you about is this incident where Jewish gravestones were desecrated. I think it was in the Cincinnati area. So just give us a quick overview of what exactly happened and also where we stand right now. Do we know who did it? What steps are being taken? Sometime in the last two weeks, about 176 gravestones were overturned in two different Jewish cemeteries that are right next to each other uh, in Cincinnati. Um, this is one of the, these are two of the oldest cemeteries in our community. Um, so they're in a part of town where there aren't a lot of Jews living now, uh, but it's where the Jewish community used to live, like in the 19th century. And unfortunately, so many of the gravestones were, 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 were vandalized and turned over face down that it's even hard to identify, you know, which, which markers were vandalized and it's hard to notify the families. Uh, we have an incredible cemetery association that manages all the cemeteries, uh, the Jewish Federation and Jewish Community Relations Council that interfaces with the police, the FBI, uh, the township where these cemeteries are located, and the law enforcement officials um, have responded beautifully. We have a community security program called Safe Cincinnati that interfaces with all the different uh, law enforcement branches. So everyone's taking this very seriously. Um, but unfortunately, no eyewitnesses, uh, not a lot of cameras in cemeteries, and so uh, they don't know who the perpetrators are. Are you surprised that this happened? Like, is this part of a general rise in anti-Semitism in this part of your part of the country, or is this an outlier? Uh, I'll tell you, I was, um, I was the Jewish Community Relations Council director about 15 years ago, and this would happen from time to time. It was usually teenagers who would come over and they would knock over a few graves in a cemetery. Um, and, and there wasn't even any real indication that there was an anti-Semitic intent. It could have just been teens goofing off. So that was kind of my first reaction when I heard about this. But then I, then I you know, actually read the press release and saw there was 176 graves. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of, that takes a lot of teenagers if it's, just, if it's right. just teens goofing off. So th this, one got, this one did surprise me uh, just in terms of the scale of it. Um, there were no um, obvious anti-Semitic symbols or, or, or um, graffiti or anything like that. Um, but there, yeah, again, there's something about the scale of this that just uh, it doesn't seem like it's a coincidence that it happened in the Jewish cemetery, especially when you consider the context of all the increasing incidents of anti-Semitism in Cincinnati and around the United States and around the world. So actually, that leads to my next question. You know, as someone who lives in Israel, I'm I'm sometimes confused about how big of a problem anti-Semitism is in the U.S. right now. Sometimes I think that what we're seeing are the the splashy headlines, the big stories that get a lot of attention, but that when you're actually there, there's actually not that much anti-Semitism. And then sometimes I believe that actually there's actually quite a bit and. I'm actually only hearing the tip of the iceberg, but there's quite more than I'm actually aware of. So what do you, what's your take on the state of anti-Semitism in America right now? How how bad how bad is it? Joel, through most of my adult life, I, I've I've been you know sort of both of the, the the I've held both of the points of view that you just uh, articulated in my own head. There there are times where I felt, okay, this is this is bad, this is getting worse, and there are there are times where I felt, okay, let's not uh uh, let's not make this an overblown thing. I, I, it, it's, it is bad now. It's there, there, I think it's undeniable that um, in the last several years, and especially since October 7th, there's a lot of conflation of, of, of anti-Israel activity and anti-Semitic activity. Um, there is a, an obvious and demonstrable uptick in these incidents. Um, and I don't think we can afford to just minimize it or dismiss it. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it, is, it is encouraging that not only the law enforcement, but our elected leaders are taking it. President Biden commented on this vandalism in the Cincinnati Jewish Cemetery last week. He, he tweeted about it, um, you know, condemning it. Uh, locally, we have community relations partners in the interfaith community that put out statements. So um, it, it's good that, we, you know, we, we don't feel we're totally alone, that we've got friends and neighbors and partners and, and leaders who are taking it seriously. And at the same time, it's frustrating because, uh, there, there, there are often double standards where, uh, you know, Jews are, are are sort of left to feel like they're they're alone in this. It's it's a, it's a, it's an interesting contradiction. For the final question, I wanted to ask you, I want to ask about kids. 
Uh, I know, you know, you and I first met at Camp Young Judea, and I know you're still very involved in Young Judea and Jewish camping in general. I know you have two teens of your own. How are kids reacting to this? What questions are they asking? What are they feeling? And what's what are you saying? What are adults saying to teens, either to reassure them or just explain? I think like most age groups, um, what's happening with Jewish teens, it sort of runs the gamut. Uh, there are some who are very anxious and, and very concerned about what's happening, and there are some who it's just not remotely on their mind. Um, my own kids, I, I think, are somewhere in between. Um, they're cognizant of what's happening, and, and, and they see it, and they're concerned about it, but they're not overreacting either. Uh, you know, after, after October 7th, there was... Um, a lot of activism in a very large public high school where they go. And uh, there was a walkout led by the pro-Palestinian students. And, and my wife and I, we asked our kids, are you, you, know, are you concerned about this? Do you, do you feel that you're gonna be um, isolated or, or, or alienated if you don't join in this walkout? And they looked at us like, that's not remotely how it works. <laughs> you know? So how does it work? Because I, I would actually love to hear a little inside dope on, on what, on what they, that's all about. They said there are walkouts every day about about climate issues or racial justice or or um, I mean, there's, you know, and it's a good thing that there that there's activism and it's you know it, it wasn't comfortable that this one felt like it was you know uh, very anti-Israel and 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 from my kids' perspective there was a lot of misinformation and and For sure. uh, you know bad context but that their point was um, you know students do. They, you do you basically. So, so, you know, if, if you want to walk out, you walk out. And if you want to stay seated in your class, that's okay. And, and um, you're not judged for it. Um, but, which I, I thought was kind of an encouraging thing to hear. Yeah. So different from when you and I went to high school, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for joining us and enlightening us a little bit into what's going on, especially for me being so far away. I'm always looking for the context over there of how Jews are feeling, and uh, you certainly helped. And just great to reconnect with you personally. Well, that's what family does. And, and you, you, know, you mentioned the hostages, and I, I can't believe that it's nine months, and, and we're here I thinking know. of the hostages and all of you in Israel every day. So thank you. All right. Lehitero Tadaraba, Brian. Hope to see right. you here soon. Sounds good. So once more, a thanks to Brian Jaffe, everyone. Now we're going to quickly finish up with some of your questions that you sent in this week. So this is actually an anonymous question that was sent in. And you'll see why in a second. She said, this is a very personal question. I have family in Israel who I miss, but I also miss the land. I feel an attachment, which I can't explain. I have tickets to go to Israel in a week, but I'm getting worried about the possibility of war in the north. My fear is airlines canceling flights. I wouldn't mind, but I think it would be a strain on U.S. family if I get stranded in Israel. So here's a typical Jewish question. How close do you think we are to war in the north, and should I change my travel plans? Well, I'm just one guy. I am not Expedia. I'm not a government leader, but my take on it is that you can and even should come to Israel this summer. Like I said a little bit earlier, I actually don't think a war is coming. But I understand your fear. And the fear is not necessarily of your plane being hit by a missile on the way in, because that's extremely unlikely. The airlines wouldn't fly if that were even a risk. I think the bigger fear is getting over here and then being stranded and not being able to get back. And by the way, Israelis are talking about that too. Israelis, some Israelis have talked about leaving the country before the war with Hezbollah happens. And the, uh, the big question is, when would it be too late? What if we keep waiting and waiting and then the airlines cancel their flights and we are stuck in Israel? Now, I don't know many Israelis who are talking like this, mostly immigrants who have passports to other countries who, who can sort of afford to have those conversations. But again, my take on it is that, yeah, there's a risk. But if I had to hedge my bet, I, I think you would be okay. And I would encourage you to come. Our tourism is needed really more than ever here. And Israelis totally appreciate it. Uh, and I know a few listeners who are actually here, here in Israel right now because they've been writing to me about how they can volunteer and what they can do when they come. So my personal take, I would love to see you here. Our second question, and we're only going to do two because this is sort of a long 
episode with our guest today is please tell us about Israelis who've been evacuated from their homes since October. Will they be able to return home? Well, that is really the big question. The The thought right now is that when there is a ceasefire with Hamas, which is looking more and more likely, then hostilities with Hezbollah would die down, and then it would be safe for the residents of the north to move back. Now, one group that's actually pretty adamant that we should have a war with Hezbollah are the residents of the north. They feel that they should not be going home until the Hezbollah problem has been taken care of, because they do not want Hezbollah to do what Hamas did on October 7th, come through the border, kidnap, pillage, destroy. And they do not favor agreements. They don't favor UN resolutions. And they want the Hezbollah threat completely removed. And the way to do that, they feel, is through combat, through war. And so that is one group that really does want this war to happen. And uh, to I guess to our previous question, they would tell you not to come because they believe a war should be happening and will. Uh, but right now, the real sad part is, is that these residents of the North who've been displaced, they're still displaced. Uh, we had an American citizen injured today, gravely injured today by shrapnel from a rocket that Hezbollah fired into the North. The Knesset did approve 500 million shekels more to help these displaced families continue to receive some sort of income and meet their housing needs elsewhere. But these came at the expense of a lot of other very in important institutions. So to make up to to make up for the 500 million shekels allotted to displaced citizens, there were cuts made to Holocaust survivors, to education, to health care, other really essential pillars of Israeli society. So it is it is affecting us. I can't not point out at the same time that 30 million shekels was allocated to the ultra-Orthodox Haredi yeshiva movement through the Shas party. So that's where a lot of the money is going as well. That's why so many of us, including myself, are so frustrated with the government we have in power right now. We're now going to conclude this episode of Inside Israel with our Hebrew is magic word of the week. And this word isn't so much magic, it's just new. I've never really heard it until today, and so I wanted to share it with you. The word is leshabesh, lamed shin, bet shin. And in future episodes, I'm going to have a graphic on the screen somehow so I can show it to you. But for now, the word is leshabesh, lamed shin, bet shin, and it means to disrupt in a or in a in an angry way. And today, like I said, is a day of Leshabesh. It's a day of rage here in Israel where people have been called out to protest and to disrupt uh, normal life. Um, so Leshabesh is a new word that I was introduced to, and I, I had to ask Dorit what it meant, although I sort of had a feeling when I heard it on the radio what it was. But it's a good one. You want to impress the Israelis you're talking to? Use Leshabesh. It means that you know about these protests and these days of rage that are happening. That is all for this episode of Inside Israel. Again, thank you to Brian Jaffe, my friend from Cincinnati, for joining us. To get the links to the live broadcast, you can always do that at joelchaznoff.com slash podcast. I'll put that here in the chat right now. That's also where you can sign up for my newsletter, Hebrew is Magic. Every Thursday, I send out a newsletter with a Hebrew word where I break it down and tell you about the life lessons we can find in that word. Email me your questions ahead of time. You can do that through my website as well. I look forward to seeing you next week. Our broadcast will be at 5 p.m. Eastern on July 14th. You'll get a notice about that on Thursday in the newsletter and the day of on Thursday, on uh, next Sunday morning. Also, some exciting news. I've got some really cool interviews lined up. So over the summer, I'll be interviewing some really neat Israelis about the current state of Israel and where the country is headed, not just related to the war in October 7th and Hezbollah and Hamas, but all others, all these other aspects of Israeli society, which I find fascinating and which I really think you 
you need to know about if you love Israel and want to know more about the country. So stay tuned for more on that. And if, by the way, if there's a certain issue you want to learn about with regards to Israel, email me that as well so I can find the appropriate expert to interview. For now, I'm Joel Chasnoff signing off from Israel. The recording will be on my website within 24 hours. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, the Hitra Oat. And thank you so much for coming out tonight, everyone.